Jesus plus nothing, 100% natural, no additives. Andrew Farley's celebrating your freedom in Christ. Call in and ask your questions at 877-956-9566. That's toll free at 877-956-9566. Via satellite from Texas, it's Andrew Farley Live. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Andrew Farley Live. We are live for the next hour across the United States and Canada, even parts of Mexico, on Sirius XM. We're here for you to take your calls. Maybe you have a question about something you heard in the sermon today, or maybe you have a question about a scripture passage that's been bothering you or something that's going on in your personal life you want to get advice about. We'll be here for the next hour the number to call, 877-956-9566. The lines are lighting up. We've got one open line at this time. If you want to get in, uh, we would love to have you at 877-956-9566. So uh, folks have been asking, you know, how can they support? What can they do to keep the program going, keep it on the air, keep it uh, thriving and surviving? Well, uh, it's easy. You can go to churchwithoutreligion.com. Again, that's churchwithoutreligion.com. You can click on the giving tab. It takes about three minutes to give. We are supported by listeners like you, so uh, we could certainly use your help. Uh, we're calling upon you right now. Maybe you're you know, listening to this program as you jog or work out, or maybe you're on your way to work or on the way home. You catch it later as a podcast, or maybe you're watching or listening live right now. Uh, we could sure use your help. It costs us about 100000 a year to do the program. And if you've uh, been following us and you like what we're about and you want to support us, uh, please consider going to churchwithoutreligion.com and click on the giving tab. Uh, right now it's about 50-50, pretty close to 50-50. Our church takes care of half of the cost. And the listeners take care of half of the cost. But we can't do this forever. We're counting on you. Uh, if you're excited, if you are supportive, and you want to help, then go to churchwithoutreligion.com. Well, uh, let's go out to Annapolis, Maryland, and talk about hell. Hey, Edward. Hi, Dr. Farley. How you doing? I'm doing okay, sir. How are you? Oh, I'm doing fine. A few weeks ago, you had a caller, and he was... You got on the subject of hell, and I wasn't sure if I heard you right because I was doing something, but I had the radio on. Did you say that you were not sure whether it was uh, annihilation or if it was eternal suffering? How, how do no, you... I, I, I didn't. Mm -hmm. Oh, I was just Go saying, ahead. how do you view it? Yeah, I mean, I uh, I certainly lean toward the fact that it would be eternal uh, punishment. Uh, you know, the fact is that you can find some verses on both sides, and that's why I think that it, it is, an, is a debate. I don't know that it's uh, something we have to fully understand this side of heaven, but sometimes the uh, passages use the word destruction, mm -hmm. um, and then sometimes they use the word eternal destruction, and sometimes they use uh, eternal punishment away from the presence of the Lord forever. Uh, you know, I'm reminded of Thessalonians that says that. So you, you look at the um, Revelation chapter 20 and 21, where in chapter 20 the dead are thrown into the lake of fire. Um, because of their deeds and you know uh, there's there's a view out there that they burn forever and there's a view that says well they burn for a time for an eon and then they are um, you know uh, destroyed okay. as their life ceases uh, so it, there is there are verses on both sides it's it's a little bit difficult to comprehend I think there's an aspect to it that we may not understand fully we can't be a hundred percent sure until we hit heaven. Um, but I, you know, the, with the vast majority of evidence there, it seems to be eternal to me. That would be my opinion, too. And I realize that the rich man and Lazarus is a parable, but I, 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 it definitely points towards uh, the fact that he's not, he, it's going on and on with him, you know, and yeah. he can't yeah. get any relief. <clears throat> well, that's, uh, I just wanted to clarify that. Dr. Farley, I enjoy your program. I listen to it every week, and uh, I'll be calling you again soon. I'll think of something else. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All yeah, right. Please do, Edward. Appreciate you, brother. Thank you. Bye-bye. 
Bye bye. All right. Well, we just spoke to Edward in Annapolis. Now let's go over and talk with Mark in Annapolis as well. Hey, Mark. Hi. Good afternoon, Doctor Farley. How are you, sir? Good. Um, let's see. I was calling you several weeks ago. A lady called in, and she began to itemize things that were happening in her house that related to what she perceived as a spiritual attack and mm. demonic presence. And I don't remember your entire answer, but a particular part of your answer really fascinated me. You, if I recall correctly, you said to the lady, I think you're creating a bottomless well of because I, she was responding in specific ways to what she perceived this spiritual attack was. And I wonder if you could elaborate a little bit. Do you remember the call? Yes, yes, I do. Uh, it seemed like she was beginning to interpret all of her circumstances and all of the events that take place around her as uh, a tool of the enemy or as a an attack or phases of an attack. And it it seemed to me that she was very analytical about it and also very introspective about it. And she was wondering if it was her fault that she might be spiritually attacked and if it was something that she had done. And so she was racking her brain in order to find out what sin she had possibly committed to bring on this attack. Mm. And I think, you know, looking back, Mark, my... My advice was, first of all, um, you know, the enemy, he attacks us day and night. He accuses us day and night, the, the book of Revelation says. It's not because we've done something awful. It's because we're children of God. And be simply because we are children of God, we can undergo an attack. Uh, the enemy is author, the author of confusion, the author of fear. Um, but at the same time, I don't want to be looking for the devil under every bush. Uh, and I'm afraid that, you know, at that time, that caller was making a, a mountain out of a molehill. And, you know, the Bible tells us in First John that the evil one cannot actually touch us. And I'm afraid that sometimes we feel like the enemy is more powerful than he is. But he is indeed all bark and no bite. And sometimes we can be suckered into fearing his bark. Um, but really there's no bite there. We can trust Christ that the evil one can't touch us. And Mark, time and time again, I just see folks who, um, you know, are fascinated by the enemy and they are fascinated and tantalized by, uh, talk of the enemy and talk of spiritual attack. And, and really the Bible basically just says, flee from all that, flee from it, ignore it. The enemy can't touch you, uh, resist to the devil and he will flee from you. So we don't have to be running and running and running uh, from the enemy as if he's powerful. We just really need to resist him, ignore him, and set our eyes on Jesus. Is, is a part of that what you just described, the fact that when you proceed in that realm, there's, there's a level of subjectivity you're basing more on feeling, and it's, it's not as reliable? Yes, my feelings can tell me all kinds of things. I mean, there are there are folks of certain religions to this day that if, say they experience a, a tingling in their stomach and that that is the experience of God, uh, uh, some sort of burning or tingling in their stomach, and that's one religion. And then another religion might say that they experience a sense of getting clear and they get rid of the you know, the uh, particles in their life that are uh, confusing and they get clarity and get clear and that's sort of a nirvana type experience. And I mean, it is scary to think about all of the religions of the world and all of the emotional experiences that people claim to have uh, through those religions. So I just wouldn't put any stock in any feelings or any experiences. I mean, Paul even warns us about this stuff. Don't don't uh, cater to someone who takes their stand on visions. They're puffed up about what they've experienced or seen. Um, you know, anybody can say anything. There's people getting knocked over in church. There's bodies gyrating on stage. There's people who say they're out of control, that God has taken over, and that they're, 
you know, convulsing on the floor, uh, you name it. If you want to find a, a, a quote, spiritual experience, it's out there to be found. Uh, but I don't, I don't put any stock in any of that stuff. I, I just have to set my mind, not my emotions, but I set my mind on the truth of the gospel, namely that Jesus took my sins away and that Christ lives in me. And that's the ultimate Christian experience is Christ in us. And, um, you know, Mark, there's just nothing better, nothing greater, but it is a mindset. It is not an emotion. Oh, and and if I could ask one other thing in relation to this, if you take Solomon or, or let's say the author of Ecclesiastes, and this person says that he threw himself greatly into many different focuses and endeavors, and then he found a level of, no matter what he pursued, that that there wasn't this satisfaction in his soul, and then it, then he concludes the book by by saying that the conclusion of the matter, you know, as best I remember, it was to fear God and, and obey the commandments. But I wondered if you could offer any scriptures that would be either instructive or cautionary in the sense that it, there's something inside us as humans that we tend to throw all of our the investment of our particularly emotional energy and and maybe I guess another way to say it is idolatry into various things and what are some scriptures that could protect us so that we would keep our focus on Christ and on on God and and not throw ourselves into uh, all these other potential pursuits and the and the subjectivity that might be attached to them. Yeah, well, you know, the first thing that comes to mind is is the book of Philippians, where Paul says he counts it all. I mean, this is Philippians chapter 3. He counts it all as dung, which is almost a dirty word. I mean, dung there is a light translation, but he counts it all dung or garbage or as refuse. Uh, he counts it all as rubbish, um, you know, compared to knowing Christ. So you've got an Old Testament, an Old Covenant perspective in Solomon, and he's saying, look, I went out there, I went down aisle one and aisle three and aisle seven of the grocery store, I went shopping for fulfillment and purpose, and I'm telling you, everything is vanity, 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 everything except, uh, you know, following the Lord. Well, and he mentions commandments, and of course, in context, he's going to mean the law, the Jewish law, which he was under. But then, under the new covenant, of course, Paul is not saying the law, is the uh, be-all and end-all of human experience. He is saying that knowing Christ is the be-all and end-all. So in Philippians chapter 3, beginning in verse 8, you know, he's just finished giving his resume, and boy, is it impressive. I mean, he's an impressive religious specimen. I mean, he has obeyed the law pretty well. He's found blameless by his best friends. Nobody can find fault with him. Yes, he's hiding something. He's hiding a struggle with coveting. But besides that, he looks pretty glowing. And so he's got it all. He's from the right tribe. He's got the right resume. He's got all the right activity. He's zealous. He's eager. He's awesome. I mean, everybody would have said that Saul of Tarsus was awesome. He's got it going on. And then, uh, of course, Paul tells us that uh, everything else is just stupid. It's just ridiculous compared to knowing Christ. So I would invite people to consider Paul's resume in Philippians 3 and and see how your resume stacks up. I mean, our resumes are pitiful. We are not as zealous. We are not as eager. We did not try as hard. We did not have 613 laws to aspire to. Paul tried all those things, and in the end he says it means nothing and that knowing Christ is the ultimate human experience. Thank you so much, sir. Yes, Mark. Well, thanks for your call, and you call again any time. We're going to jump right out to uh, Fort Collins, Colorado now and talk with Dominic. Hey, Dominic. Hey, brother. How are you again? Good. How are you, sir? I'm doing well. Okay, so I'll get right into it. My, my question, <clears throat> actually I have two questions, but they're both in Ephesians. The first one is uh, based on Ephesians 6.4. And mm-hmm. uh, I wondered... Uh, you know, that's the one that talks about fathers don't provoke your children to wrath and bring them up mm-hmm. in the training and admonition of the Lord. And I'm wondering, um, as we're reading that, um, and then we go to live our lives with our children <laughs> as parents, yeah. Yeah. what role do, do you see the law playing in the parent-child relationship, especially with respect to 
teaching them mm-hmm. manners and customs and you know family rules, expectations, things of that nature. So that's the first part of, of, of my question. Sure. Well, let's take that first. Uh, I would say that the law should play no role in, in my life as a parent. Um, it's very important to me to make that clear to people that, uh, you know, if I were going to make the law part of uh, my parenting, then, you know, it's really not a pick and choose. It's not a multiple choice. It's not a cherry picking situation. Uh, you know, if my kid uh, was stealing or had committed certain uh, sins, then some of those are punishable by death. Some of those are punishable by stoning under the law. And so the last thing I want to do is look to the law uh, as my uh, guidebook for punishing my son or disciplining him. So then you say, well, what in the world does Ephesians 6 mean? Well, it says, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, uh, which is the first commandment with a promise. The reason that he quotes this is not to bring back every, every bit of the law. I mean, he's not bringing back the law here. Uh, That would undo Ephesians 2 and Ephesians 3. Ephesians 6 would be denying the reality of Ephesians 2 and 3, where he just got done telling us that we are dead to the law and not under the law. So, you know, whether it's Romans or Galatians or Ephesians or Philippians, you name it. I mean, Paul has clearly shouted from the rooftops that Christians should have no spiritual relationship with the Jewish law, that we are free from that. So why does he bring it up in Ephesians 6? His point is, look, kids, do you want to, I mean, do you want to live long and prosper, so to speak? Do you want sound advice? Well, you're going to get it from your parents, not from your peers, but your parents. Your parents care about you deeply. And so he's saying that parenting has been on God's heart for a long time. He uses the law of Moses and a quote from it in order to establish that this has been on God's heart for thousands of years. Uh, He's telling the Ephesians, this is not a new idea. This is an ancient idea. Ever since Moses, God has been declaring that children uh, are to obey their parents because there's a benefit there, a benefit of sound advice and wisdom. And so then in verse 4, he says what I think is just an incredible verse for me and for all the fathers out there. He says, don't make your kids angry like don't provoke them to anger don't be the source of them being upset but instead notice that the opposite of that is to bring them up in the discipline of the lord so what that tells me is that the lord does not exasperate his children the lord does not provoke his children to anger the lord doesn't frustrate his children and cause them to have outbursts of anger so Um, What that tells me is that the Holy Spirit is a gentleman and that my heavenly father treats me better than any earthly father ever could. And so I begin to look to him and live from him, not just live for him, but live from him. And I begin to father my own child from him, from this attitude of being gentle and kind and patient. And yes, there's a place for discipline. I mean, that's what this is about. We instruct our children, you know, just like Jesus had disciples. The word discipline is from the same word disciple. It doesn't mean that we beat them to death. Uh, It means that we mold them and shape them and instruct them without exasperating them or provoking them to anger. The only way we can do that is by trusting in God's spirit. He's the only father who does it right. Very good. Um, the other side of that was, and maybe it, maybe it translates, is Ephesians five twenty two twenty three. Um, mm-hmm. Wives submit to your husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife. Also, uh, as also Christ is head of the body, uh, head of the church, and He is the Savior of the body. So mm-hmm. instead of just looking at that as you know a general submission passage, I I wonder if there's a connection, if he has that same sort of heart or perception or faith that he's talking with and he's talking to the children not to uh, provoke their, their parents, or I'm sorry, vice versa, their parents not provoking their children. Do you mm-hmm. see that same sort of line of thinking in that passage as well? Well, you, you begin in verse 22 of chapter 5, and, and basically, um, you know, really the news starts a verse earlier. I mean, we typically start in 22, but the news starts in verse 21. Uh, there's even a chapter or a paragraph header 
in some Bibles that, that make it appear that 22 begins it. But really 21 is where the submission talk starts. And it says, and be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. So whatever this submission is within marriage, it is also uh, the same submission to one another uh, in Christ. And so uh, this is not something unusual or abrasive or offensive or uh, unique to marriage. Um, it is actually a submission where I submit myself to you and you submit yourself to me. And we also submit ourselves to our wives and our wives submit themselves to us. And so it's about relationships and it's about uh, thinking of the greater good and thinking of the other person. And so, you know, by the time you're done, if you truly start in verse 21 of that chapter and continue down through the end of it, I mean, you're a dead man in terms of performance uh, because nobody can do this apart from the vine. Nobody can do this apart from Christ. I mean, uh, you know, love your wives just as Christ loved the church. Give me a break. I, I can't pull that off. Uh, it's a joke for me to even say that I'm scratching the surface of that. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Well, Christ hung on a cross, a total sacrifice, laying his life down. Uh, few of us, if any, have done that. And we were probably greatly annoying to our wives before we did it. <laughs> so, you know, there's no perfect performer. There's no perfect husband out there. So in that sense, Dominic, yes, we are back to dependency on the only one who can do this. Jesus Christ is the vine and we're just a branch. Thank you for your input. I appreciate that. All right, Dominic. Appreciate your call. You call again anytime. Uh, the number to call, 877-956-9566. We're going to have an open line here in just a minute. Right now, all lines are filled. I encourage you to wait about two minutes and call in, 877-956-9566. Let's go out to Fairfax, Virginia, and talk with Chris. Hey, Chris. Hey, Andrew. There are two subjects I wanted to ask you about today. The first one has to do with Romans 8.8. It says, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. We can derive from the following verse when he says, you are not in the flesh but in the spirit, that those who are in the flesh are those who do not believe in Jesus. So following that logic, it seems like he's saying that everyone before Jesus uh, could not really really please God, which in, in one sense I can kind of see because they didn't have the Holy Spirit and you know they were working out of only the limited resources they had available to them in the form of their flesh. But if that's true, then what's Hebrews 11 saying when it talks about all these people before Jesus and they had faith, and he's saying faith pleases God. And even right there in verse 5, he says, Enoch pleased God. So can you can you explain that supposed contradiction? Yeah, well, you know, it's just not a fact that uh, zero people had the Spirit before Jesus. Of, of course, some people did have the Spirit. The question is, what kind of relationship was it? We know that the Spirit of God fell upon Samson. We know that the Spirit of God fell upon David. Uh, we know that David said, please don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Uh, we know in the book of Peter, Peter writes in his epistle that uh, back in the day, the Old Testament uh, prophets were trying to discern while the Spirit of God was upon them or in them, trying to discern what days and what hours that certain prophecies were pertaining to. Uh, so there's a number of passages that clearly lead us to believe there was a relationship with the Holy Spirit prior to Jesus. Um, the question is, what was the nature of that relationship? I think what is unique today is that uh, every child of God is led by the Spirit. Back then, there were prophets and certain believers who, for a time, you know, they might have enjoyed a special anointing, a special project, or a special mission, like Samson, like David. And uh, many times they might have felt like David did, saying, please don't take the Holy Spirit from me. He sure is wonderful. He sure is wonderful. Please don't take him from me. And so there was a coming and a going, and there was a qualifying, and uh, there was a, a sense in which the Spirit of God would visit people and perform divine acts of service. And what is unique about this side of the cross, Chris, is that we have 
a permanent relationship where it says we have been sealed until the day of redemption. Uh, so we are sealed with the Holy Spirit. It's permanent, uh, you know, and that relationship will ne- will always be unshakable and unbreakable. There's no condemnation. Why? Because the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set us free from sin and death. So the spirit is the reason we're saved. Every Christian has the spirit and every Christian has the spirit permanently. In the Old Testament, things weren't quite that way. But there still was a working of God's Spirit in the Old Testament through people. Hmm, okay. So do you think that maybe Paul's um, <clears throat> Paul's logic in Romans 8.8, 8, when he says that those who are in the flesh cannot please God, do you think he might be um, excluding from that uh, Old Testament examples like Enoch and Abraham, who apparently did have faith, and apparently yes. they did have God. So so do you think in some sense they could be said to be in the Spirit? What do you think about that? Yeah, I think that you're not going to find that verbiage in the Old Testament, but I think there's an element here, Chris, that's quite beautiful. Um, it's like they had the credit card, and they were charging on the credit card, but the bill was paid um, at the cross. And so... You know, Jesus passed over the sins previously committed under the Old Testament, under the Old Covenant relationship, and just at the right time, Christ died. That doesn't mean that uh, nobody before that was just, uh, you know, had any luck. They were all out of luck. Of course not. But it, it does mean that there were people looking forward to the work of the Messiah, and we're looking back at the work of the Messiah but we are going to see Enoch and Abraham and, and various people who live by faith, including Rahab the prostitute. We're going to see these folks in heaven. And uh, they had a relationship with God. Would I say they were in the spirit? Um, in one sense, I would. Uh, eternally, they are in the spirit and we will see them in heaven. But I think there is something special about uh, what New Covenant benefit is on this side of the cross. I mean, if you look at Hebrews 11, it doesn't stop with these heroes like Enoch. It finishes with, and they did not receive what was promised, and we have something better. That's how the chapter ends. So it's important that we read until the end and discover that these Old Testament saints these Old Testament believers, these Old Testament children of God who we will see in heaven, who had a relationship with God's Spirit of some kind by faith, that we still have something better in the words of Hebrews. And uh, that's, you know, something we might try to fathom for the rest of our days. What is it exactly that makes it so much better? I can only think that it is this that Peter, James, Paul, John, not a single apostle ever says, please don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Uh, Please create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit. No, no, the spirit has been taken care of. The heart has been taken care of. The Holy Spirit's presence has been taken care of. And for us on this side of the cross, even on planet Earth, it is a permanent relationship. Cool. Yeah, I remember when I called two weeks ago, you used that analogy of the, the gray stream pursuing the law stream, which I like. Um, I, I know I'm kind of taking up a lot of your time, but if I could uh, quickly get your input on my second subject, which is I know I've heard on your show before that you said that giving financially doesn't necessarily entail getting financially. And I wanted to ask your opinion on two verses that kind of sound like that's true. Luke 6.38, when Jesus says, given it will be given to you, and then 2 Corinthians uh, 9.10, in which uh, Paul is saying, God will multiply your seed and then, like, uh, more resources for you to give. What is your interpretation of those verses? Mm-hmm. Okay, well, you know, looking at Luke chapter 6, verse 38, um, you know, backing up a little bit, he says, uh, you know, do not judge and you will not be judged, do not condemn and you will not be condemned, pardon and you will be pardoned, give and it will be given to you, they will pour into your lap a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, for by your standard of measure it will be measured to you in return. 
uh, this is law-based stuff. I mean, uh, you know, do not judge or you will be judged. Well, wait a minute. For a Christian, they're not going to be judged. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Do not condemn and you will not be condemned. Well, I mean, what if a Christian dies with one condemning thought in their heart towards somebody? Uh, pardon and you will be pardoned? Well, what if I don't pardon? What if I die with an ounce of bitterness towards somebody and I haven't forgiven them? Am I still pardoned? Well, of course you are because it's the blood of Christ. It's not my ability to pardon. So, uh, you know, in the context of this passage, uh, you know, he is really raising the bar. He's saying, of course, you know, you pray for your buddies, but I want you to pray for those who mistreat you and their hearts sink. And then he says, give, I mean, get this one, uh, Chris, this is a big deal. Verse 30, give to everyone who asks of you and whoever takes away what is yours, do not demand it back. Okay, so that means that if you're a true believer in this in this verse, a true liver, a true obeyer of this passage, then you should say, well, because I'm a Christian, all my belongings are available now for public consumption, and whoever takes them from me, I will not have any retribution of any kind. So you can see how this would just lead to a ridiculous lifestyle uh, where, you know, if people got wind of, of you holding this attitude, they would literally line up at your house and just remove your furniture. I mean, they would remove your furniture, your rugs, your 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 house itself, your food, you name it. Uh, and you're supposed to just sit there and take it. So this is the standard that Jesus is teaching in Luke chapter 6. We have to understand that this is the standard of the law. It is the true spirit of law-based living. It is a total sellout. It is a total commitment. It is a total obedience to a perfect standard, and no one can do it, and that's the whole point. And, and it's very important that we understand that, otherwise we end up with a gospel that says I'm forgiven, but I'm only forgiven if I forgive. I'm not condemned, but I'm only not condemned if I don't condemn. I'm not judged, but I'm only not judged if I don't judge. And so then we have a me-centered gospel by trying to mix Luke chapter 6 with the rest of the New Testament epistles. It's a marriage that just doesn't work. Uh, it makes no sense. We can't marry Moses to the New Covenant. Uh, cheating on Jesus is what that is. We've got to abandon the old way of the law, including this Luke chapter 6 treatise on law, which shows us the perfect and impossible standard. And instead, hold tightly to the grace of God that is a free gift in Jesus. It's not about us. We're not in the equation. Okay, so uh, do you have time to li- li- quickly, quickly comment on 2 Corinthians nine ten, and then I'll hang up. Sure. Uh, yeah, we can do that. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 9 um, and uh, verse 10. Okay. And that's talking about giving as well, right? Yeah. Okay, do you want to read it to me while I'm looking at it? Yeah, uh, he basically says, like, uh, God will increase your seed and multiply your seed so that you'll be able to be generous in all occasions, something like that. I'm not actually looking at, at it in front of me, but okay. that's kind of what it says. Okay, so he says, God is able to make all grace abound to you. Notice what is abounding, not money, but grace. So that always having all sufficiency, what kind of sufficiency? Is it a monetary sufficiency? No, it's grace-based sufficiency. It's grace that is abounding. It is a sufficiency of grace in everything so that we can have an abundance for what? For every good deed. What is it that gives us an abundance of every good deed? It's having enough grace. It's having enough of the life of Christ. It's having enough spiritual resource not physical resource, not monetary resource. Uh, In another passage, Paul tells us, I have learned the secret of contentment, uh, whether having plenty or having little, whether living in abundance or living in poverty, I've learned the secret of contentment. And he says, if we, you know, uh, have food and uh, clothes, we should be content with that. So when you get down through the context of this, uh, Chris, I don't think he's talking about a monetary, um, uh, you know, payback from God or anything of that nature. He's really talking about having sufficiency in grace, having grace abound, having an abundance of grace for every good deed. And then he says, now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food 
will, will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of what? The harvest of your righteousness. And you will be enriched in everything for all liberality, which through us is producing thanksgiving to God. So, you know, what is it that they'll be enriched in? Well, it says everything. Does that mean that they all turned out to be multimillionaires? Uh, no. Does it mean that any of them, you know, that did God bless any of them with money? Should they wake up and say, thank you, God, for this money? Absolutely. There are people, Christians, believers who, who wake up and say, thank you, God, for this money. But we all know that there are literally, as I speak, millions of Christians across planet Earth that are dirt poor. They are in ditches, lying in southern India, suffering. And this prosperity gospel thing is not going to work for them. I could read uh, Corinthians over and over to them. I could read Malachi 3 over and over. And they will remain in their condition, dying of leprosy or whatever it might be, with not a dollar to their name. And, uh, you know, that's why I think you just, we have to put these things in context and, um, you know, yes, give thanks for everything. Yes, God gives us everything we need for life and godliness, but that does not mean money. Uh, otherwise, you know, God is holding out on some of his children because clearly millions of us are dirt poor, even to this day. So, uh, Chris, I hope, I hope, yeah, I hope that helps. Yeah, thank you so much for the way you give to uh, not just me, but to uh, everyone listening to your show. Have a great week. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it, Chris. You call again. Um, always love it when you call. Let's go out to Ricky in San Antonio, Texas. Hey, Ricky. Hey, Pastor Andrew. How are you doing? Good. How are you? I'm doing good. I want to first of all say thank you for the message this morning. Um, I never had Roman 8 explain the way I had it explained today. I never understood it until this morning that the Bible was not just written to Christians. It was written to both believers and unbelievers, and the apostle was talking to them at the same time mm. and letting us know what position we're in. But I had a question for you concerning, I think I might know the answer because you kind of answered earlier. Uh, mm. mm-hmm. A lot of ministries, well-known ministries, produce these teachings on DVD about their heavenly experience and being put in trance and visions and things like this, and they go into great detail explaining to people the things that they've seen, their conversation with Jesus, their perspective and visions of Jesus. And my question was, I guess, kind of twofold. Number one, when Jesus talked to Thomas, he told Thomas that he was blessed because he saw him, but then he said, blessed were they, meaning us on this side of the cross. Because we have not seen, we believe. And in Paul, in Colossians, I think it's Colossians 2.13, tells us to let no one keep defrauding us of our prize by mm-hmm. delighting in a basement and worship of angels and taking stands on their visions. So is that kind of what's, what uh, is happening with that? Um, y- yes, absolutely, Ricky. I mean, um, you know, if somebody says to you, let me tell you about this vision I've had, uh, they know what they're doing. Uh, they, you know, five minutes later, you are going to have heard their vision. And then the next thought is either, wow, look how spiritual they are, or I wish I had experienced what they experienced. Where's my God? And why don't I, why am I not on the same level as them? Uh, so, you know, I mean, Jesus just blows all that to smithereens. He says, go, guys, go pray in your closet. Don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. And Paul says, don't take stands on visions and don't pay attention to people that take stands on visions. I mean, the whole thing is just a flesh show. I mean, it's just a uh, uh, a whole a spiritual pit of look at me, look how spiritual I am. Uh, if you've had a vision from God, great. So did Paul. Paul, apparently, if we, even if it is him, he lets us doubt. He, he leaves us in doubt. He says, I know a man who went up to the third heaven and apparently experienced heaven, uh, and, you know, he doesn't even claim it's him. Uh, exactly. So, you know, is anybody going to deny that that happened? No, but Paul doesn't even take ownership of it. So what in the world are we doing saying that we saw an angel or we saw Jesus or we saw a light or we saw this or we saw that? I mean, I wouldn't put any stock in it because, you know, what happens is that person rises and then that person falls in their performance. And we say, oh, my gosh, I put so much stock in what they said. 
Well, don't put stock in what I say, what you say, what anybody says. Just put stock in what Jesus Christ did. Okay. And uh, then my second question on that is kind of what you mentioned about what Apostle Paul said. That's one of the things that the, when you talked about this morning, the Holy Spirit, he a bear witness with all spirit. And when I had heard that, one of the things he, uh, the Holy Spirit, I believe, said to me in my consciousness was that, why is it if Paul's saying all these things, then Paul didn't try to go into great detail, just like you just said. Uh, and also he mentioned that even when John had his visions and revelations, there were certain things that John wasn't allowed to uh, even write down for us. You know, he was told to fill the books up. Right. So, so uh, am I on the right track with thinking that way? Because I believe that was the Lord speaking to my heart concerning those things. Uh, oh, yeah. Ab- ab- absolutely. Yes. Okay. Yes, Ricky. Absolutely. Uh, you know, you, the people who have uh, are known the Lord and are coming to know the Lord, they are marked by a humility that comes from God's Spirit. It is not a homegrown humility. It's not a flesh-grown humility. It is just an acquaintance with the fact that, look, I've got nothing to offer. I am, I am nothing. I, I'm nobody in terms of spiritual resource. Christ is my resource, and if Christ wants to teach me something great, uh, but, you know, for me to run around and say, look what I saw and look what I did and you need to be like me and you need to have the spiritual gift I have and me, 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 it's all it's all puffed up stuff of the flesh and uh, there's really no place for it. The spirit of God doesn't uh, doesn't honor any of that. OK, and I want to say thank you, Pastor, um, whether you realize it or not, I want to encourage you to be encouraged on the true message that God has delivered to the body of Christ and to me and my family. Um, I'm constantly supporting the ministry, and I would like to say over the radio station, for all those who are listening, hey, you know, I've been tricked since 2012 to give me and my wife over a half a million dollars to the Name It and Claim It group, uh, not point fingers, but if you're going to give money to anything this is what you want to support because I've never been freer in my life than knowing that it's not about me, but it's about Jesus plus nothing. And so I encourage you to support Pastor Andrew and the gospel that God is preaching through him. Like he said a couple of Sundays ago, don't listen to him or any other man. You listen to the word that he is teaching and you go back to the word and the Holy Spirit of bear witness. I thank you, Pastor Andrew, and much blessings on you and your family. Well, thank you, Ricky. I sure appreciate you, brother. You call any time. And those who want to contribute, again, you can go to churchwithoutreligion.com. That's the website, churchwithoutreligion.com. You can click on the giving tab, and it takes just a few minutes if you would like to support. Well, let's go ahead out to Albany, New York, and talk with Joe. Hey, Joe. Hey, Pastor. You know, I really appreciate your, your thoughts on these subjects and your tone. It's not condemning, it's not lecturous, it's just feeding. So that's great. I have a, you know, your first call I talked about how eternity and everything. It's yeah. a subject I actually studied a lot about, and I think unless you really take the time to study that all out, you know, you kind of miss things because we're taught certain things. Mm-hmm. But the most yeah. important in Christianity is. Uh, John three sixteen, you know, and there's right. the time it's over and over again. Is you either have eternal life or you don't. So, a person who's not born again doesn't have eternal life. Mm-hmm. So how could they be punished eternally? Yeah, different? well. Uh- Yeah, I see what you're saying. Um, You know, I don't, it sounds very logical to say, well, they don't have eternal life, so how could they be punished eternally? I guess what I would... Well, they're punished eternally like like electrocution for a murderer. That's an eternal Mm -hmm. punishment because there is no parole, there's no reprieve, there's no second chance. Mm -hmm. It's an eternal punishment, but it's not... Well, Joe... uh, Joe, Joe, I hear what you're saying. Um, you know, if, you, if you're asking for my opinion, I, I would love to give it to you. Uh, my opinion is that uh, Matthew 18 says there is eternal fire. Uh, Matthew 25 says there is eternal punishment. Uh, Mark chapter 9 says there is an unquenchable fire. Second Thessalonians 1.5 says there's everlasting destruct- destruction. Yeah. And Ju- 
and Jude 7 uh, says that there is um, an eternal punishment. Those are yes. just, uh, you know, six of the passages we, that I... But can you remember what hell was created for? Hell was created for Satan and the fallen angels. Okay. Well, Joe, if you want my opinion on that, uh, Revelation 20 says that all of those who had uh, evil deeds that were not forgiven, that they are thrown into the lake of fire for their evil That's deeds. And, and everyone who is not written in the, in the book of life, they are so thrown you, into the lake it, of fire. So those sound it, like people to me, not, uh, not demons or something. So uh, anyway, that's uh, my opinion. Uh, hope that helps uh, there, Joe. Um, I'm not sure if you uh, called to ask a question or not. Maybe you did. But uh, for those who want to study it out, um, I would just encourage you to uh, go ahead and consult these scriptures uh, that I mentioned. If you want to study it out and draw your own conclusions, um, the passages to look at would be things like, well, um, the undying worm and the unquenchable fire in Isaiah 66. Uh, the everlasting contempt in Daniel 12, the uh, eternal fire of hell in Matthew 18, the eternal punishment uh, mentioned in Matthew 25, the unquenchable fire uh, that is mentioned in Mark 9, the everlasting destruction that is mentioned in 2 Thessalonians 1, the punishment of eternal fire that is mentioned in Jude 7, the blackest darkness that is reserved forever, uh, for those who um, don't believe, is mentioned in uh, Jude chapter 1. There's only one chapter of Jude, Jude chapter 1, uh, verse 13. Uh, Revelation 14 uh, also talks about uh, the torment that rises forever and ever. Uh, Revelation 20 talks about the lake of fire, which I mentioned there at the end with Joe. Uh, those are just, um, you know, a dozen or so passages that uh, reference this. I've spent a lot of time looking at it. Like I said, I don't think it's um, the be-all and end-all of Christian theology. We can debate that till the cows come home and the Lord too. Uh, but the reality is that, uh, you know, there's going to be some passages that cause us to second-guess things. But with the body of evidence, it certainly does look to me that uh, they don't experience eternal life. They experience eternal death. And because they are eternally uh, dead to God, but still alive, they're alive to the world, they're alive to Satan, they're alive to wrath. Uh, for that reason, there is an eternal punishment for those who reject the gospel. That's my two cents, uh, Joe, uh, out in Albany, New York. Thank you for your call, and I hope that is helpful to you uh, if you did um, you know, want, it, want my opinion on it. All right. Uh, well, let's go to Germantown, Maryland, uh, listening on WAVA and talk with Marty. Hey, Marty. Yeah, thanks for taking my call. I appreciate it. I've never called a radio station before, and uh, I'm really grateful you took it. Uh, I got an unusual statement that I don't mean to I mean, I mean with all my heart. Is that, uh, I, I really don't think uh, just by people saying they're a Christian, they, they are a Christian. And I just wonder if most of the world is not kidding themselves about who they are or what they have to do to follow God. And, I and what uh, what would you say? Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's an interesting point. What would you say they have to do to follow God? Exactly what Christ said to do. I, I'm not. I'm also saying too that I'm not a Christian. I used to be a Christian, and there's nothing more that I'd want to do than be a Christian. But. Uh, yeah. That's and what, what is it that they need to do um, that, they're, that they're not doing? What is it that you need to do that you're not doing? Uh, that's what Christ said. He said um, in Luke fourteen thirty three. he said, If any man follow me, let him deny himself and, and, and give up everything and, and, uh, and forsaken everything that he has, he cannot be my disciple. I mean, everything. Mm -hmm. Take everything like I... I don't care if I had $50, it's the last $50 I had, or or if I was a millionaire, I'd have to give it all up and walk away and not turn back and go out and serve Christ. And I trust you. I believe in you. Mm -hmm. The only mm -hmm. people that believe in Christ are actually people that do that. I've done it But twice. there's nobody, there's nobody who, who does that, right? You're saying there's no Christians, really. Cause nobody well, I didn't think that. no. I said I was a Christian twice. I've done it twice. And mm -hmm. I came back. My shame, okay. I came back. 
Post did you um did you did you have curiosity what my thoughts were on that passage or did you want to ask me about that or did you just well, want to the make passage a about hell? No, I about the denying yourself, giving up everything, and how how a person could do that. You guys pretty much made me uh, listen to the radio in the car and I pulled over and um, it's it's all the way or not at all. I mean that's the way mm-hmm. Christ has always been. I mean you just. It's not. He doesn't yeah. set off for certain things. It's just. He said, "If you okay. if you will be perfect, and that's what he wants us to be perfect. You know, to be somewhat perfect or a little bit better than we were before we while we were sinners. He wants us to so be." So, is perfect. there anybody, Marty? Is there anybody on the earth that's perfect that can be perfect? Yes, absolutely. There have been perfect people in the past. I, yes. Okay, I've never not from birth. Not from birth. Not from birth. Okay. Only Christ was oh. the only one from birth was perfect. Okay. Well, thanks, Marty, for commenting. I appreciate your call and your uh, your interest in the program. And um, I want to uh, go ahead and just comment a little bit on that passage and share share what my thoughts are. You know, as you look at Jesus saying, um, deny yourself and give up everything uh, and take up your cross is really where he goes with it. Uh, that's what we do spiritually when we enter into Christ. Um you know, if I had to wake up and just give up everything, and then the next day giving up everything would be really easy because I wouldn't have anything from yesterday. <laughs> I'd give up everything, and then I'd give up everything, and then I'd give up everything. Uh, ultimately, if anybody lived that out, they would just be, uh, you know, lying in the ditch uh, with no clothes on and have nothing. So it's um it's a bit of a mystery. It's a spiritual mystery that Jesus wants us to understand. But the answer really is simple, and that is that when we decide that we are not uh, getting fulfilled from this life, that vanity, vanity, everything is vanity, that I could have, like King Solomon, all of the money in the world and all of the uh, sexual relationships in the world and all of the fleshy fulfillment in the world and yet be totally empty inside, well, then it's pretty dang easy. It is pretty easy to say, uh, well, there's not much here anyway, so I'm going to go for Jesus. And when I go for Jesus, I am denying that there is life anywhere else. And I am taking up my cross and following him. Where do I follow him? I follow him into spiritual death. I follow him into spiritual burial. And I follow him into spiritual resurrection. And it, this is a work that he does. It is a heart surgery, a DNA swap, an exchange of personhood. Uh, he does the work. All I do is say, save me. And uh, what he does is he takes me through this heart surgery and this DNA swap. And he makes me new at the core. At that point, I've already denied myself. I've become a new self, Romans 6 says. I've become a new creation, Corinthians says. So the old is gone and the new has come. The the denying of self is over. Uh, Then I continue growing and learning, and yes, I do deny fleshly attitudes, but myself is not the problem anymore. I already denied myself. I already had myself crucified, Romans 6, 6. I already had myself done away with, Galatians 2, 20. And so I'm a new self, a new creation, with Christ at the core, That's the meaning of the passage. It is not a performance passage where we do our best to clean up our lives. There is no one who can be perfect. Instead, we inherit perfection as a free gift, the free gift of righteousness, so that nobody can brag about it. So, uh, Marty, I hope that's helpful to you. It's impossible to become a Christian and then not be a Christian and then become a Christian and then not be a Christian You'd mentioned that you became a Christian twice. Uh, Well, what I would say is that you tried to deny yourself twice. You tried to give up everything twice. You tried to clean your act up twice. You tried to be religious and obedient twice. Uh, But what true salvation is, is when we give up even on that. Are you willing to give up on your self-improvement? Are you willing to give up on the cleansing of your own life? Are you willing to deny that you can fix you? and instead submit to someone who is not you and let him make you into a new creation, a new self who is righteous at the core, a righteousness that lasts forever. Have a great day. For more information on Andrew's books, please visit andrewfarley.org. That's andrewfarley.org. Join us every week at this time as we invite you to celebrate the freedom of God's grace. Goodbye, everybody. Goodbye.